Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the GMT Podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea. This week we're coming at you, of course, with two brand new reviews for two brand new three. records. We're doing oh, three. three my bad. We're going to be talking about the new album from punk rock band Pup. We're going to be talking about the unraveling of Pup the Band. And we're Got also em. going to be talking about the new album from podcast favorite band, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Talking about Unlimited Love. Unlimited also. Love. And we're going to be talking about a favorite band of Morgan and I. We're going to be talking about the new album, the first album in a long time from the rock band Placebo. We're going to be talking about what the fuck ever that never, album's called. N- never Let Me Go, I think. Um, never indeed. Let Me Go. Please don't ever do that. That one. That's the album. And this week on the Jams and Tea channel, we have lots of stuff for you. We, of course, have very big video, very fun video new video from riley doing a solo countdown of the 10 best everything everything songs go check it out if you haven't see if your favorite everything everything song is on there and if it's not tell us about it rant about it tell him why he's wrong even if you fucking play even if you don't care about that band go and watch it anyway because i've tried my best to make that shit look (laughs) like a proper channels video with like music video clips edited in and shit so we need that fucker to like do some numbers. Yeah, and hey, it's doing pretty well so far, so keep it has been doing going. Well, yeah. We also covered, uh, we talked about my record club last week, which was on Evanescence's Fallen, uh, you know, a bit, bit of a bit of a, a classic, I think some might say, uh, talk about that record. And last week we talked about Soul Glow and Denzel Curry. So we have lots of stuff for you. Oh, wait, that. and one more thing. On my personal channel, August Movie Reviewer, uh, you can find my a latest video, a, a podcast with my dear friend Monica, entitled the Bradley Upper Crust Podcast. Of course, from the the th- a reference to the character from the uh, Goofy movie Saga. Uh, we talk about Sonic the Hedgehog, <laughs> the movie, the motion picture, the cinematic data file. We talk about that for about thirty minutes. Sonic the Hedgehog in general. Monica's amazingly funny talented person uh she's a great editor you should watch that video and let's sort of get into what we've been listening to for the last seven days and try and keep it a little bit more of a of a limited segment since we're reviewing three main albums this week but jake what are the absolute most notable things you want to shout out that you've been listening to in the last seven days first thing i want to shout out is that i've been listening to a lot of some particular bands one of which being ulcerate a uh, band that we have talked about before on this podcast mentioned uh, their most recent record, um, Staring to Death and Be Still. As New Zealand band, albums. notably. New Zealand uh, death metal, sludge metal, atmospheric sludge metal, all kinds of extreme metal variants. Uh, their, that album was on multiple lists of ours and is generally a pretty beloved record from us. And so I've been wanting to go through their discography proper Um just because they have a really like tight set of records, but they have enough that it's like really like, oh, I want to see, you know, the the ins and outs of their career. And I listened to their first album a while ago and then just didn't continue. But this week I listened to two of their records. I listened to uh, the incredibly named album, uh, Everything is Fire, which I mean, like- (laughs) So true, King. Just an impeccable name. And I also listened to The Destroyers of All, uh, which again is also so aptly named. These are the two highest rated uh, records in their discography and they're fucking fantastic. I mean, like it sounds kind of boring to just fillet them as we have been doing. Um, I think their first record so far is the one I'm the least impressed with. And I still think that is a, a goddamn spectacular record, but I want to shout out particular, everything is fire. This album is fucking nuts. This goes so wild with all of its time signature shit. Like, I feel like Staring to Death and Be Still is, like, it's a hard-hitting record, but it's almost comparatively way more atmospheric than their other stuff is. Everything is fire, on the other hand. This shit is going to fucking pummel you. Like, there's, a, there's like, one or two songs in the track list that are very well-placed uh, throughout it to sort of even out the listening experience as a whole. But for two or three long, uh, track-long runs on this 
you are just going to be viscerally beaten by this band's insane rhythm section. Oh my God, the drummer on this is fucking nuts. I don't think I fully appreciated the full breadth of his technical ability, um, maybe on Stare to Death or Be Still, but this just, oh my God, he's fucking fantastic. Worth listening to uh, for that alone. But yeah, Ulcerate, 100% a band looking at, worth looking into. I have yet to hear a record from them that feels anything short of like the peak of this kind of music. Yeah, from um, what I can gather within the modern sort of death metal community, they're generally regarded as one of the best active bands um, in general. So, and, and from what mm -hmm. I've heard anyway, like I would probably go as far as to call them the best New Zealand band, like depending on your tastes as well. Like they don't off, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't have a New Zealand sound in particular, but I don't, I can't think of a band that's come out of my country that are more technically talented and musically uh, adventurous than these guys so even if death metal isn't your thing check these guys out steer into death and be still is a really solid intro even if you're not super familiar with a lot of death metal it's a great record and um yeah any any attention we can throw also rates way not that they need it from us but still i want to do their whole discography and potentially even maybe make a video on them or something or in some way acknowledge mm -hmm. their work as uh, a fellow countryman but um we'll see what happens there yeah totally i mean just 100 if you like death metal every single record they've make is for you um the other band i've been listening to like really really heavily is that this was just kind of an inevitability just because of the introductory record that i listened to from them that i loved so much it's one of my like all-time favorite favorite records ever and i've been listening to a lot of current 93 uh, spurred on mainly by the fact that they do actually have a new album. Um, it is called If a City is Set Upon a Hill. It's one of supposedly two, record that's, two records that is supposed to be released this year. Um, it's on the shorter side, like 37-ish minutes. Um, that said, great record. If you are really into, you know, stuff like neo-folk or like the drone folk kind of stuff that they're like particularly into, kind of the alt uh, Americana side of like a band like Swans or something. Uh, I, they're, they're a really unique band in their unique genre blends in their overall like textures and sounds. They're just, they're really cool. And they have a ton of different records. So like their discography is kind of intimidating to get through. Um, so I think that's kind of what put me off for a while. So uh, once I listened to the new album, which is very, very good and also a really like accessible record that if you want to try and get into the band, this is a good album to get your mileage off of. It's just a, it's a divinely produced record. It's very traditionally sounding. It's like the most, it's a really good like representative of the band's sound but it was not the only album from them I've listened to. I've also listened to one album called Of Rune or Some Blazing Star, which is one of their more beloved records, uh, as well as uh, Invocations of Almost. Uh, of Rune or Some Blazing Star is definitely on the weirder and more esoteric side of the band sound. I would not necessarily recommend that to a newcomer. And the album I would even less recommend to a newcomer is actually Invocations of Almost, which is an album that has an interesting story behind it. It was supposed to go along with some kind of actual like art gallery thing. And it was supposed to be like a soundtrack to it, but it never got made through. Uh, and this is sort of seen as like a lesser release from the band, but I fucking loved it. It's really, really heavy on like the ambient side of their sound. Uh, but as such, and like it, it, since it was supposed to be paired with like an actual physical art installation, a lot of the sound here is really like tactile. You can feel some of the really like weirder textures that they play with is it's really, really super awesome. Uh, I had a great, like I had a great time with it. It's like listening to this band is, is like, it, I wouldn't call it like hellish per se, but it's definitely like apocalyptic. They're a band that have a very, very unique sound and they do, and they achieve a very unique emotion with that sound. So again, not for everybody, but I, I highly recommend their work and their like lesser loved stuff, just because there is something to really appreciate about all of them. Mm. Um, and I guess the last thing that I will mention here, I've listened to like a bunch of newer records that I thought were, were pretty decent this year, but 
an album that I listened to very recently today at the recommendation of our friend Connor, uh, who invoked uh, the Mars Volta, which is the easiest way to get me to listen to something. Because if you say, hey, sounds like the Mars Volta, I'm like, "Mm, fucking gimme. Uh, and that would be uh, RX Bandits, uh, a band I have heard of before, but haven't really like found anything out about. And he was just like, hey, this is like if the Mars Volta were combined with like ska. And I was like, I mean, I'm interested, but also what? And to be fair, there's a heavy, like, it's really more of the ska punk kind of stuff, a lot of the heavy emphasis on the horns, but I listened to their album, uh, And the Battle Begun, which, God bless, it's terrific. Every single track here is just an absolute blast. They they focus, it, I would say that it's like the instrumental, like, tones and variety of something like Francis the Mute, but strip away the ambience, and if they just kind of went through for like bangers only. It's like if every song on the album was Elvia Elvia Kez. And as such, it's just a rager, weird time signature shit. Uh, The lead singer has some really expressive vocals, but they're not like as hard to get into as somebody like, you know, Cedric. But overall, just a really great, really unique record that has enough rooted in like progressive rock uh, to really like, you know, keep you there. It's not like so weird that you're like, what is this combination of sounds? Like, no, I I pretty confidently say that anybody who likes the Mars Volta sound is also going to like this. And it's just very upbeat, it's really fun. Uh, All the songs have really, really interesting structural choices. Super this podcast core. So go check that out. They have a couple of pretty good albums from the looks of it. So I'm happy to check those out too. August, what have you been listening to since you were last on the show? Yeah, well, a lot of bullshit, honestly. So I'm not <laughs> going to talk about music I've been listening to because I've not liked most of it, honestly. Instead, well, I'll talk about something in, something a bit of a change in formula for this show. Something that we haven't really done because a lot of our experience in this show have been very based around the COVID pandemic, you know? It was around since the show started and is still ongoing. So I'm going to talk about two concerts I went to recently. The first of which was Tool. Saw them on their Fear Inoculum tour. Is that, are they still touring that album? I guess they well, can they, tour it for as long I guess as they, they want. I guess they never had a proper chance to tour yeah, that's initially. True. That's true. Fair enough. But I saw them. They're, the live experience, which is kind of what I'll be describing for them, is it's almost equally auditory and visual because they pull out this giant fucking like metal curtain and they just project images on front of and behind themselves. It's really, really psychedelic. A lot of what they played was, unfortunately, from Fear Inoculum. But I, the live setting does bring a certain life to those songs. Like, Chocolate Chip Trip goes from, like, a D-tier tool song to, like, an A-tier tool song. Just by virtue of seeing Danny Carey, like, pull that off live by himself with like playing the synthesizer and the drums at the same time like that's cool i do know they played some classic tool tracks like uh oh what i remember they played uh 46 and 2 no I, actually I, did they, they play sch- the- they better have played schism they did not oh, yeah. they actually avoided most big singles aside from opiate Huh. huh. Wow. Fuck that. If I were to see Tool and they didn't play Schism, I would want a refund. I mean, they're a big enough band. No, fair enough. They can they can play whatever the fuck they want and get away with it. Like they still They'll played like Smashing pumpkins and they don't play 1979. <laughs> still played the get over, grunge, get over yourselves. So that was cool. Okay. Okay, Schism is right. not the 1979 of the Tool discography, as good of a song as it is. <laughs> And okay, you know, okay, what the plot what, what was is also been? played. Um, so that was cool. I don't know. Fucking this is 
This is some solid Sober. pedantry on everyone's part. Yeah, Sober, I think, is the obvious one. That, so that is yeah. a good pick. I also, yeah. Which, I, I'm really like, it's super cool that you got to see them live just because I imagine they're an interesting act. And I, I also think it's not as much a hot take to say that I bet it really appreciate, improves your appreciation for Danny Carey's drumming. I, oh, I think yeah. the older he's I get, so, so the more good. I think he's just the best part of the band. I mean, just, the yeah. band is quite literally Danny Carey and the tools. <laughs> <laughs> I like that so much more than Tool. That, that They need to change that. Uh, but yes, that was a very interesting experience. Just getting to see them perform. The opener were decent. I didn't hear as much of their music as I would have liked to. And they're like, they're a group called the Acid Helps who have like two singles out. And I mean, they played an album's worth of tracks, so obviously they've got something down the pipeline. So I might uh, maybe, pay attention to that. Maybe their asses need some help picking a better band name. <laughs> I don't. I'm free. I don't cost you anything. I I know you don't. <laughs> yes, you do. Anyway, what was the other show you went to see? August? The other show, which was actually my preferred of the two was animals as leaders uh Mm. one of my favorite bands in this kind of gentosphere primarily for their record the joy of motion which is absolutely phenomenal like if you don't like the joy of motion you you simply don't like fun you don't like fun music you don't like to have a good time their music is really kinetic energetic it's heavy it's fast it's pummeling the new album isn't bad either i like uh parisia mm. a fair bit it's maybe not like top tier but it's, you know pretty pretty good so on the actual experience of animals as leaders their opener was a group that was called intervals who are also kind of an instrumental gent group they were really fun. They have a lot of great. That is, that, that is like instrumental gent band name generator intervals. It's like if Black Midi called themselves Time Signatures or something. <laughs> <laughs> but no, anyway. they uh, they were actually good. The band itself is just one guy, which again, her her gent. Oh shit! Uh, I actually didn't know and, that. Yeah, and uh, I actually. Not animals as leaders, but they were one guy at one point also. Oh, uh, okay. So actually it applies to both. So good stuff. Fair enough. I, I got to meet him after the show. He was a cool guy, but oh, their shit. show was their shit was awesome. Then animals as leaders came on and fucking di- outdid them 10 times. Oh. It was insane. Like they spent the whole show like just building up and building up like the excitement and energy in the room. And then they fucking released it with the song Physical Education, which is one of their most like identifiable big singles. Song kicks ass, yes. And hearing that live was just in fucking, like the crowd just went batshit insane. But yeah, the live experience of Animals as Leaders I mean, I, feel, I fucking saw them on their third show in the tour or something really early on. But yeah, I recommend that live experience if, it, if it's coming around you within the next couple months because they are so fucking fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to say, since it seems appropriate here, that I also listened to Animals as Leaders this week. I listened to the new album, Parisia, which is my first exposure to them, admittedly. I have Joy of Motion on my list to listen to in the next two or three days, so I will be talking about that next week. But I have really enjoyed this new record uh, and, and just the That's sound great. of this band more than I expected to. I was like, okay, a genty sort of proggy metal band. I'll probably dig them, but I actually was really taken with the record. One aspect of their sound that I hadn't anticipated, which is, I guess, my own overlook, is how jazz influenced they are as performers. Yeah, like yeah, the level yeah. with of to which their compositions and their playing reflects a clear uh, education in, in jazz music and performance. Uh, and that lends a lot of their compositions a lot of power. Add to the fact that they're also, I don't know if this is true of all their records, but Parhesia is an instrumental album. And yeah, they are. 
are all instrumental. And that's something I really appreciated because it gives you the space to really take in all of the textures and all of the compositions and all the detail itself that's happening, which is not to say that, you know, bands that use vocals in this style of music, you know, are holding themselves back in some way, but it was just a refreshing experience to really have this pure sort of sensory thing where you weren't necessarily having words thrown at you at the same time. You could just listen to the sounds and textures of the music. And I was really taken with it. So I can only assume that given how much I enjoyed this, that I'll enjoy the, uh, their other records as much, if not more. So um, they get a big um, shout out from me as well. I, I, yeah, clearly I need to get my shit moving on animals as leaders. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Biggest thing I want to highlight, um, biggest sort of discovery is that uh, not even a discovery really, um, because I've had this on my list to listen to for ages because this is a record that I know has meant a lot to Jake for a while, which is the Harold Budd and Brian Eno with Daniel Lenoy collaborative ambient record, The Pearl from 1984. Um, this is one of those later classics in the progression of Eno. It's ambient work that for whatever reason eluded me for until now. And I can say confidently that it is one of the best works that that Eno has been involved in. I need to get myself a little bit more well versed in Bud's music too. I know that Jake has shouted out a number of his records too, and they've always sounded really appealing to me. But the Pearl was fantastic. I was really taken with um, how moody and glacial, but also how sort of expressive and colorful this record was. It has a reasonably dour and kind of somber and melancholic tone, but also at the same time you don't really feel sad listening to it. It's got this kind of calming, comforting um, impression that it gives off as well. Lots of beautiful texture. It's a really rich uh, sounding ambient record, the pianos, and um, there's a lot of Fender Rhodes piano, I think, on this record, and it sounds gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, I love that shit. Texturally, it's, it's completely my bag. So I listened to that, and I also, uh, uh, when I was listening to it on YouTube, it also played uh, Brian Eno's Thursday Afternoon after that, which is an ambient record that he made around the same time as The Pearl, actually, mm -hmm. uh, which is a single hour-long track. And I just want to shout that out, because that's a great piece of ambient music yeah. from Eno. Uh, showcases uh, tape hiss and the sound of tape hiss, uh, which when utilized right in ambient music, can be one of my favorite textures ever. And it's just a beautifully kind of enveloping uh, landscape I, I think ambient music works best when you have this neutral tonality to it where it doesn't really particularly evoke any emotion particularly strongly but it has a sort of like complexity to it that um it's a very difficult thing to do well uh without because if you try and make ambient music that sounds too much like a particular emotion or too emotionally strong it can come across as cheesy or it can come across as kind of cloying um, so, but what makes Eno and Bud so great is they're able to, they understand the, how to make that ambient music sound a little bit more emotionally complex while still being quite strongly evocative. So, um, but if intellectualization aside, if you just want to hear a really great ambient record, absolutely listen to The Pearl. Uh, fan fantastic album. Uh, if you were really into that, you need to check if you're really looking for an in with Bud stuff specifically the uh, Harold Budd and Robin Guthrie uh, sort of double album project. Um, it's like As the Day Breaks and Before the Night Falls, those two records, that is just an absolute cavalcade of some of the best ambient music ever made. That's one of my favorite projects from there. That's a great, like either one of those or as a whole thing, a great like accessible window into there and I'm just really glad you enjoyed the pearl too it's not often when like music that I find on my own that isn't like already interesting to someone else on the podcast is, is taken in by other people so I am simply just glad that more people enjoy it another record I want to shout out is uh discovery from the rate your music charts a new album from the techno IDM musician Max Cooper. He's a London-based musician. He's put out a few albums that have done sort of reasonably mildly well within his scene. Uh, he put out a new record called Unspoken Words uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I gave this a listen, and I really, really enjoyed it. To me, it's uh, a great example of a modern techno record that very clearly has like 90s house and tech house and glitch uh, influences but it's also incredibly friendly as well and also parts of it have this kind of maximalism to it that I think will make it quite uh, enjoyable and appealing to people who aren't super well versed in electronic music 
Um, I, I don't want that to sound condescending. I'm by calling it like entry level or whatever, but I do think that it's a record that is very approachable for fucking morons. I do think it's a record that's very approachable in a genre that can sometimes be quite esoteric. Um, so I highly recommend it to anyone who sounds anyone who's interested by that. It has a lot of really great highs, and it's just a, a great record to just let it wash over you, and and um, it, it really holds up. So Max Cooper, Unspoken Words, gets a wreck from me, and um, a record that Jake recommended last week on the podcast, uh, the new album from a doom metal band Shape of Despair their album um return to the void which is i believe jake's current album of the year as um yep. he said last week on the show really enjoyed this too want to um, spend some more time with it as well because there's so much to soak in atmospherically but i was really um taken with it and i could immediately understand and see the bell witch comparisons that jake has made with regard to the sound and an impact of this album when you listen to it uh, it's quite one thing I'll say just from one listen is that it's quite emotionally direct uh, in a way that not a lot of doom metal is to me, which is not to say that I find I feel emotionally disconnected from doom metal. It's just that I don't often go to it for the emotional catharsis necessarily. It's more of a textural thing, but um, there is a particular brand of doom metal that has this emotional catharsis baked into it. Mirror Reaper is one such album, and I'm delighted to say Return to the Void is another too in that vein. I think I believe when Jake talked about it, he talked about how kind of like nihilistic and sort of hopeless it is. But I think, and that's certainly true, but there's also, uh, it's also very emotionally evocative and, and very powerful in ways that I think maybe will hit you more than you might expect just from that um, description. So I, it, I, I highly yeah. recommend it. And I mean, it's Jake's favorite album of the year. So if you're watching this podcast, that should be enough of a take for you to go and listen to this thing. It, it's something that makes you like, no, no matter what, feeling you get from it even if it is direct or even if it is like very nihilistic I do feel some kind of peace at the end of it which is really like you know you just kind of endure this wave of you know the the, the sound and then once you're it's that's sort of the the final track is does a fantastic job of sort of giving you closure on the experience I think so mm -hmm. And that's all I have to shout out this week. So let's get into our first review of the day, which is the new album from Placebo, Never Let Me Go. This is the first Placebo album in, I think, nine years. And we have, or at least in our, what we've been listening to segment in the past, Morgan, and I think maybe Jake as well, uh, has mm -hmm. talked about how some of Placebo's later work kind of gets a little bit overlooked. Uh, Placebo, I guess, have never really been a particularly cool band in the alt-rock world. I think I've seen a lot of people sort of clown on them. And I think just a general reputation of just being a you know okay has been what has led me to just not really check out their music. But um, I was assured by Jake and Morgan that they were a band worth giving a shot. So um, Morgan, I think it's only fair to turn to you at this point. Um, what's the sort of context we need to know in terms of approaching this record and how does it compare to the sort of music they were making before they kind of went on hiatus nine years ago? Their last record, uh, 2013's Loud Like Love, was I think pretty universally considered their worst release. And you know, I don't get it. Um, nope, it's weird. Far, far from a perfect record, uh, but it, and it's and it's pretty messy. But like, Jesus, if it doesn't have like four or five of their best songs on it, it's it's very strange to me. The public relationship with that record, but music of any releases of any kind have been pretty few and far between in the nine years between Loud Like Love and Never Let Me Go. This might have been before Loud Like Love, but they uh, ditched uh, the drummer at some point in time. And now it's just a duo of Brian Malko and Stefan Olsdahl, bassist, guitarist. Um, Orphan-ass name. Yeah. Uh, I will save you, mother. I will thank you, father. I will kill you, Fjolner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> things I, things I say to myself every day when I wake up until April 22nd and uh, yeah this is their first release in nine years and it's 
sort of especially after loud like love and the note that that record ends on this is a startlingly almost life affirming record from a band that has a tendency to just be dour as shit in the best way it's like I mean, their yeah. most well-regarded album is called Without You, I'm Nothing. So that really yeah. tells you, I think, a lot about um, <clears throat> yeah, the attitude that Brian Malko conveys in a lot of his music. It's kind of very sort of slackery, losery, lonery sort of vibes that he gives off. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why people have kind of just had a bit of a bad taste in their mouths for placebo. But, you know, how does this compare sonically, uh, Morgan, to the sort of music they were doing? Uh, when they were last I, it, together. It's, it's interesting. You can 100% tell when the song you're listening to is a placebo song, not even just because of Brian Marco's distinctive voice, but just like, like the first minute or so of like Special K, for instance, is just like, oh, is it one that is a placebo song. It's a very specific sort of time and place for them and that's definitely the feeling you get off of most of if not all of never let me go as well but it's certainly there and like especially the back half has very classic sounding feeling placebo songs i think of uh this is what you wanted and twin demons in particular as a sort of just new additions to immediate placebo classics uh if you're into the band at all you probably know what i'm talking about there but stuff like uh beautiful james and the prodigal in particular i think are real standouts on this record uh for just how much fun they are and uh, particularly prodigal how life-affirming it is which is a really nice thing to hear after such a long absence and the note that Loud Like Love ended on, um, which is just, you know, one of the most crushing songs I've ever heard in my life. Bosco, uh, my favorite song uh, from them, which is hard to listen to. <laughs> yeah. And it, the sound of the product pool in particular, like laid me flat when I heard it for the first time. And this, this record in general, I think, is immaculate. But that song in particular was just like, oh, okay, this isn't like, this isn't just another placebo record, which I would like if it were, you know. But they're sort of, they're still pushing themselves and they're sort of still interested in the various avenues that they can take. They're specific, but also often applicable to many different ideas sound i think it uh, yeah it was riley who said that is, is this their integrity blues and i love that comparison because like just like late career heater that's kind of a left turn but also a return to form for a great band mm. um and i think that's pretty much exactly what never let me go is i'll go ahead and speak my piece on the record and then scooch out it's hard to say because i'm so deeply attached to records like sleeping with ghosts and meds in particular uh, but i th- i think never let me go might be their best album I, f- I find it to be an extraordinarily consistent and exciting experience in the ways that it both reiterates and diversifies their sound and what they're willing to do with it and i've I find it super refreshing, especially now, because Placebo is such a specifically late 90s, early 2000s band in pretty much every sense. I found it really refreshing to find that the band still sounds like themselves after nine years of very little new and sort of with the passage of time and how sort of uncool that this kind of alt rock might sound. I, I find that very encouraging just for a variety of reasons. And as someone who has followed the the path of this band, it's just nice to hear that as moody as they still are oftentimes on this record, that 
things seem to have reached something of an equilibrium for the the folks involved. Yeah, it's a, a stunning record. Second favorite of the year so far, just behind Angel in real time, which I, I found have some uh, interesting similarities in certain ways. Uh, like I like my favorite song of the year is the man himself, and my second favorite song of the year is the prodigal, both of which are like not at all distant sonically from each other. 2022, the year of orchestration and rock music. Who knows? Well, uh, as the other placebo scholar and person whose opinion is really not a million miles away from Morgan's, I'll just kind of speak my piece. Uh, I am also the other longtime placebo fan. This is one of the first bands that Morgan and I ever really bonded over. Um, I have a really deep attachment, again, to records like the ones Morgan mentioned, particularly Sleeping with the Ghosts. I think that's sort of a high watermark for them. And placebo in general are just sort of an alt rock band that I think they're just of those kind of alt rock bands that emerged from the scene that like really just kind of owe their existence and popularity to that of OK Computer, which is like I feel is kind of diminishing them in a way, but is also just kind of like telling of what this scene was like uh, and the kind of bands that emerged from it and why they were popular and for and to an extent why they became unpopular is because placebo is a distinctly like yeah, I mean, they're distinctly like more uncool band just because, I mean, you have Brian Malko's weird kind of whiny nasally vocals that nobody really sounds like. Um, I mean, honestly, I really could compare him a lot to Billy, Billy Corgan, vocally speaking. Um, but he is a presence you have to get used to, shall we say, um, if you're not super into the band already. Um, I'm personally quite fond of him, and honestly, I think the years have been really kind to his voice. I think he's never sounded better on this album, vocally speaking. I think he really shows off his range. The intensity of his vocal performances are pretty generally outstanding on here. He's really dynamic here, too, um, and just generally, he tends to, like, be a bit less great claiming sound on albums like The Self-Titled or uh, Without You, I'm Nothing, but I really, really appreciate the way this album sounds, um, particularly because this sounds the most like um, the album of theirs I deem the most underrated and the most underappreciated, which is their third album, Black Market Music, an album that takes a distinct kind of almost industrial uh, approach to their very meat and potatoes alt rock sound that admittedly, while I do like that album a fair bit, it's also something that doesn't really go all the way with this particular sound. I just kind of like the inclination. Here, I actually think they do a great job of it. I mean, from the first song, Forever Chemicals, the fucking drums and guitar on here, they it sounds like Nine Inch Nails. They're banging on those fucking drums. The guitar tone sounds like it is right off of the fragile. It's so good. And generally speaking, this band's uh, knack for hooks that they've been showing ever since, like, I'd say like Meds is also a pretty comparably similar album in terms of sound and songwriting sensibilities. And they have a lot of really heavy sounding sort of um, metallic uh, harshness to a lot of their instruments, uh, which again, particularly shows on stuff like the drums. Uh, but on Meds, they really, really lean into that and they really kind of make that sound their own. And I think that they basically come back nine years later from a sound that like didn't particularly work super well for them on stuff like Battle for the Sun, but really just lean into it hard here. And there are even choices where I didn't know how to feel about it first, like the uh, stuff on uh, Beautiful James, like the keyboard tonalities are like, this is like a fucking like late 80s new wave it sounds it's, so it's good like, though it's like whoa. so just you know, it sounds pristine great. i i love like every single production choice on beautiful james is great that's again one of the album standouts for me uh, and even then going into something like hugs uh the really interesting sort of like uh, the emotional side to the band sort of hidden in this kind of wry, witty lyricism that combines with the hooks is just what placebo is all about. I mean, this is like classic sleeping with ghost shit and stuff like The Prodigal, which Morgan mentioned, which this is like, again, this is this made me think of like the verve. This made me think of Oasis, like mm. the way that the string instrumentals are used as a swell in this or like, this is classic British alt rock. And yeah, Ur Urban I do Hemzero also think it's a really consistent a great comparison, actually, thinking about it. I was yeah. annoyed I didn't think 
think of that? I thought so too. That they reminded me, they remind me of them multiple times on here. And I it's really easy to see the kinship that the bands have, I think, for that like really, really specific era that was like in hindsight kind of a transitional period for the verve in terms of like the the sort of where they started and where they ended up. Yeah. But and it's when like you think placebo about, like, or sort of the band that like took that sound and made their whole gig based yeah. on that. When you think um, about like that that album, and you think about like Richard Ashcroft's like singing on like Lucky Man, where he's like, "Oh my man," like he does not sound very different from Brian Molko. Like no. you can see the vocal similarities there. Oh yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. this record has the exact same appeal to me as that album does. I yeah, absolutely. That's I. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. And like Morgan said, I think it's a really consistent record too. Is that every song here, like, while it doesn't reach the heights of something like Sleeping with Ghost does for me, because that's or even Meds, because those have songs on there like Follow the Cops Back Home or the title track on Sleeping with Ghost that are just like, I mean, that that's as good as anything that a band like Radiohead ever made. I would put something like the title track on Sleeping with Ghosts up with something like Let Down in terms of how like wow. highly I regard it specifically. And this album doesn't ever really quite have those moments that really define the band. It's really them just kind of, they, they do do it with a unique kind of life affirming vigor on here that I do as a fan of this band find incredibly fucking refreshing. I think it's really, really awesome that the band came back sounding so lively it's it's just it's reassuring to to me that this band has always been really really like intensely emotional and they can just kind of conjure that immediately after almost a decade of absence and while yes there are songs on here like um sad white reggae which i will say i really like the second half of because it just kind of goes frankly um even the first half the songwriting choices while not like lyrically i think really more the application of how the lyrics are sung and how they're applied in the song i just don't really know or understand what the song is doing and it kind of feels like it's searching for an identity until that second half when it goes really hard so th there are moments like that or songs like happy birthday in the sky where it just sort of feels like a drift for like a tiny little bit, which is also the problem I have with my least favorite track on here, which is the closer Fix Yourself, which is a little disappointing because placebo albums just nail their closers so fucking hard. Every album from them, that's like easily one of the highlights. And here, it seems to be a bit of an aimless kind of meandering track that I don't get a whole lot out of. That being said, there's 13 songs on here, and I think that like 10 of them are and fucking fantastic. Uh, I think that Forever Chemicals is a great opener. Beautiful James and Hugs are fantastic. The Prodigal is one of my favorite songs on here. And I'll even say that I really love Try Better Next Time. I think it's a great application of Placebo's hookiness and their songwriting on here is really emotional. It, I mean, the subject mat matter of the song actually reminds me a lot of um, something that would be on Rustin Kelly's Dying Star uh, <laughs> in the way that it's sort of about the mentality of getting knocked down and trying to get back up again you, you know the song i'm fucking talking about but again there's songs like twin demons which showcase how heavy this band can be and songs like chemtrails which are absolutely fun and awesome and how they just sound in the terms of the atmospherics they play with so this is not an upper tier placebo album for me but it is an incredibly solid comeback record that i as a fan couldn't really be more pleased with uh, it's not as tight as something like Meds is, but again, I almost feel like trying to besought the expectations of un wanting another Meds or wanting another Sleeping with Ghosts is a bit unfair of me. But that said, fans of the band, I think, would be pleased here. I'm glad to see that this is at least getting a, a, a decently positive uh, reception from fans just because we, they did have those last two records, which were really divisive for some fucking reason. But yeah, I'm with Morgan. I really think this album's great. I really enjoy it. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you and Morgan went first because I feel like um, while I like the record a good amount, I feel like August and I can provide a little bit of a counterpoint and sort of maybe broaden the scope of how this band can be absorbed. Uh, and one thing I'll say, because August and I obviously both have less exposure to this band it than you two. <laughs> well, one thing I'll say is I have listened to the first two Placebo albums. They're self-titled and Without You, I'm Nothing. And I enjoy both of those albums quite a lot. And they're both to me examples of records where placebo have a very specific aesthetic and it can become grating easily if you're not really completely on board with it. And yet that the aspect that can make it grating 
is also its strength when it's done really, really powerfully. And a lot of it does have to do with Brian Malko's voice, which I like, but also can only have so much of at a time. Uh, and those two albums, which are really, really strong, have both of them have like one song on each album that just like blows me away. That just like completely stuns me. Uh, and on they actually both happen to be the opening tracks on those two records. Uh, on the self-titled, it's Come Home. Uh, and on the Without You I'm Nothing, it's Pure Morning. Both of those are amazing, amazing songs. And then the rest of the album is strong and has other highlights, but never quite hits that level for me again. And I think has a, an issue where it can kind of spin its wheels a little bit. What makes Never Let Me Go a bit more easier to swallow, I think, is has a lot to do with what Morgan said, where a lot of the dourness of Brian Malko is kind of pitched down and you get a slightly broader emotional tone, a slightly more uplifting emotional tone, which can at times, I think, be a little bit cheesy, but also is a breath of fresh air compared to the dour mood and downbeat tone that Malko lingers in, in so much of the previous music that I've heard. And it's not that that's a bad thing. I like plenty of dour and, and downbeat uh, music, but Malko's strengths, I think, are really in, in, in leaning into the power that his voice can have. And I think that it's utilized really well here for the most part. I think this album starts off incredibly strongly. I'm, I'm generally a pretty big fan of the first half of this record. Beautiful James is weirdly every time I listen to this song, I love it more and more. It's become one of my favorite songs of the year. And, and even though I can understand that particular synth tonality that's used in the song being a bit uh, kitschy and, and unappealing to some people, I think that it has a triumph to it and the band boost up the arrangement really nicely and and Malko sounds great on it like it's a bit of a manic street preachers vibe that he gives off at certain points as well more I guess in the 90s stuff than here but you can still hear that um continued sort of soulfulness I guess that his voice has even if it's unconventional and yeah there are other songs I really love too happy birthday in the sky the prodigal I'll echo Morgan's sentiment that's a standout surrounded by spies is great too um the the second half of the album kind of I think drifts a bit more into this mid-tempo-ish sort of vibe to me the songs are fairly long and I'd enjoy them I don't think there's a single song on this record that I don't think is good but I do feel the length starts to become a little bit wearying by the time that you're towards the end of it but that said I'm there's never really any point when I'm listening to this record where I'm I'm over it or I'm done with it or I'm I've stopped enjoying it on some level. I think it manages to maintain a pretty consistent level of solidness uh, in that second half. But I do think that the standouts are for me all in the first sort of run of five or six songs here. Um, but I mean, it speaks, I think, too, and it gives, um, I think, credence to the notion that, you know, bands are often stuck within a tour record new music tour cycle that bands often have to be in to sustain themselves and I don't begrudge bands doing that like having quick turnover between records because they need to you know keep making money they need to keep being able to sustain themselves as a band but it can often lead to the recording process feeling very much like well we need to get material out we may need to make a new record and sometimes the spark just isn't there and that happens with a lot of bands is you the, the material starts to get more lackluster because not because the talent is gone but because there's a lot of pressure on bands to make come up with new material and release new albums and have reasons to tour so but i think what uh, never let me go give, tells you and, and kind of illustrates is how beneficial a break can actually be for a band um, because you do get the feeling that there is the sense of reinvigoration on this album. There's the sense that placebo uh, have really come back and have this real urge and desire and joy to be making music that often I think a break can be the exact thing that instills that in you as a band. And so I think that this is a record that has an energy to it and a sense of liveliness and, and passion to it that makes it really enjoyable, I think, and, and sustains the performances. Not to mention the fact that it just has more sonic color to it than the two 90s records from them I've heard. I will check out uh, Sleeping With Ghosts and Meds just to get a sense of the middle period between those, between now and between where they were most famous. That's kind of the sweet spot in my opinion. Um, so I will be digging into that, but I really enjoy the colorful sound and more electronic aesthetic of parts of this record too. It very much feels like 
a, a band that's reinvigorated rather than just spinning their wheels and trying to make without you I'm nothing a million times so yeah um, I'm broadly positive even if I do think that uh, it's still a record that suffers a little bit from its bloat it's I still enjoy uh, the listening experience on the whole well I did not care for this much I'll be quite honest <laughs> I know. Shocker of shocks. Uh, Not that this was a bad listening experience. It was just one that uh, failed to really resonate with me in many meaningful ways. I found a lot of the instrumentals quite hit or miss. I, I think some of them have a good light because a lot of this is very kind of loop based, kind of really playing off that industrial rock element of that this uh, group is kind of playing with on this record. And I should say, I'm not familiar with Placebo in any capacity. Perhaps they have some huge radio single I'm not aware of that I've just somehow heard. Probably not. Yeah, okay, probably not. So fair to say, no history with this band whatsoever. Um, Oh, what's that main bitch's name? Brian Molko? Brian Malko. Malco, oh, he is not yeah. my thing at all. I find yeah. him quite obnoxious. I find a lot of his vocal intonations really it just add an element of add elements of goofiness to these songs that they wouldn't otherwise have. If someone else was singing it, like the way he pronounces the word medicine is the most garbled, fucked up thing I've ever medicine. heard. Medicine medicine and you haven't uh, even heard him say my computer thinks i'm gay yeah <laughs> <laughs> i will say i definitely understand why that why it has that impression on you all this knowing your sensibilities and you do very much like not exclusively but you appreciate tastefulness when it's displayed in music and one of the things i kind of appreciate about placebo is how kind of uncool they are and kind of how much they lean into to a certain extent how kitschy and sort of out of place they can sound and there's a a campness to them that i i kind of appreciate too which is funny because earlier this week on twitter i came up with a comparison that i'm quite satisfied with which is that brian mulko sounds like a straight michael stipe yeah i i remember reading that and i thought that was kind of funny um and i think yeah it, it, if you if you consider singers like um stipe and like richard ashcroft with the verve and then brian Molko, you can see how this particular sort of nasal really uh intense aesthetic can have a like yeah. there's a thin line between whether it sounds like the greatest fucking voice you've ever heard or just completely not taking off whatsoever. i mean i guess another another comparison this is one that might hit home for jake but i i'm a big fan of like king tough singing and he's got yeah. a very similar yeah. kind of nasally intonation but i i find that far more palatable than something like this oh yeah way easier to get used to yeah songwriting also not really my thing some of the songs i think have pretty good hooks others are a little of obno- on the obnoxious side i mean i think really i wouldn't have had as just visceral of like a uh, reaction to this if it wasn't an hour long because the the runtime is really what just slowly it, it can break me after long enough because by song 10 i'm like can we just be done please i appreciate some of the energy this band has some of the spunk and finesse the band can bring on a couple of these songs so it's not like i'm seeing this record and being like this is just a complete wash this is nothing this is garbage i do see the elements of this band sound that are appealing it's just that though they don't appeal strong enough to me and the negatives just kind of weigh those out to be this like, I guess, unfortunately, kind of boring experience for me. It's kind of yeah. like Morgan with Richard Dawson, where it's like, if you can't really get into the presence of the vocals, then everything else is at minimum going to be a struggle. Yeah, that's 
Yeah, what August is saying is definitely very similar to what Morgan said about about Richard Dawson. And I, you know, I, and the thing is, I see it. It's it's yeah. It's just very no, much I do too. It's weird, got a weird fucking which, voice. Which side you fall? But yeah, it, it's a very ridiculously uncool band coming back and putting out a very ridiculously uncool record, and it's getting reasonably overlooked despite the fact that it's getting pretty good ratings so we wanted to shout it out and i'm glad that morgan Mm. persisted enough to make it happen because otherwise i might not have even heard it and i it it has single-handedly reinvigorated me to check out some of their um 2000s records so i will be doing that soon all right well shall we do our favorite tracks and ratings then for placebos i think we yeah. never let me go um so morgan i will let go first uh past morgan uh my three favorites on uh this album are well definitely yeah it's definitely the prodigal as number one i will also say this is what you wanted and i'll say twin demons just because it rips Le- least favorite i will i will say either sad white reggae or try better next time uh both songs that i enjoy uh but they're they're a sort of mid low point relative to the excellence sandwiched in between them i think so one of those two but i still think they're good to great songs and i will give this a nine and a half my three favorite tracks are going to be The Prodigal, Try Better Next Time, and This Is What You Wanted. Least favorite song is probably going to be Fix Yourself, and I give the album a 7.5. All right, August. You know what? It's going to be the the double Chinese satellite from me for favorites and oh, least favorites. Shit. Oh, I and love that meme. It's going to get a five from me. Uh, my favorite tracks are Beautiful James, the Prodigal and Forever Chemicals, probably. Uh, my least favorite track is probably Sad White Reggae. Uh, and I'm going to give the album a 6 out of 10. So that means that we have an average rating for Placebo's Never Let Me Go of 7.0. All right, so let's move in to our second review of the day, which is... The new album from Pup, the unraveling of Pup the band. You know what? I feel it's only fair we let Jake, the I, one, the only, take control. I was who are Pup. about to do the same. Jake, why don't you tell us uh, where this comes in the context of Pup's career, uh, what we need to know about this record, and, and how you feel about it? Well, Pup are a uh, Toronto, Canada formed band. Uh, they are known for, they've been in the, the business since around 2013 with their self-titled album, uh, and they specialize in loud, heavy, angry, snotty, bratty punk music. Uh, very, very meat and potatoes kind of stuff with their very idiosyncratic uh, lyricism, I think. Uh, that's one of the uh, stand out highlights of the band and sort of the the personality that they bring to the table with uh, both the vocals and the the songwriting, which can be a turn off to some, but are sort of an appeal, uh, a leading form of appeal for others like myself. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of this band. I love their self-titled and their sophomore album, The Dream Is Over, is fantastic. And as I've said on multiple occasions, uh, the their third album, Morbid Stuff, was my album of the year in 2019, maybe my favorite punk rock album ever. Um, it, it was just the perfect balance of the way this band can speak to someone emotionally and with their sort of irreverent, Um, really funny uh, lyricism that like uh, it's a bit left of the dial humor wise but it's also just it's really dry and really sarcastic and it it just really appeals to me uh, in a way that a lot of other bands don't Uh, a lot of other punk bands are just kind of like you know you, you have like a green day which is the very like slacker kind of you know fuck everything but the things I care about whereas Pup is distinctly more like they're they're just sort of framed by the modern world and the relationship that you have to it. 
uh, which I think makes their music speak to a lot of people. Uh, so this album is curious because it led off with some singles and some album artwork and the bit of information that I think came out about it first that I read was that it was produced by Peter Cadis. Uh, we've covered several albums who've been produced by him, no, mm. not the least of which being, I think, a Frightened Rabbit album, maybe. He produced one of them. Produced yeah, he, he produced multiple of the records, I believe. Or it might yeah. just be Pedestrian Verse and Midnight Organ Fight. Anyway, yeah, Cadis yeah, yeah. is indie rock royalty. He's produced, I think, mm-hmm. the last several national albums. He mm-hmm. is uh, produced the Gang of Youths, Go Father and Lightness. Uh, he has had his. And I think he produced a new one as well. He he has mm-hmm. an incredible track record and his sound and production style is very much, I think, a big part of the sound of indie rock, or at least popular indie rock, what we think of. So mm-hmm. his involvement here is notable for that reason. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, like, and with one of the singles, Robot Writes a Love Song, Pup was obviously signaling the fact that they were doing something different just because this just didn't have the same very, again, the the other Pup records are just very straightforward, whereas this is just not. And uh, at least in my opinion, there seems to be no really unified consensus on the record. But um, very expectedly, um, I love this album. Um, I think that of pups four records i would say that maybe yeah i'd I'd say that maybe it's better than the self-titled but it's not as good as the dream is over or morbid stuff from the sheer fact that some of the songs on here just kind of are pup doing what they normally do very well but without any of the not any of the but without the same vitality and urgency that they had on those previous two records um, I mean, wheel spinning in a way that I wouldn't even say is really negative, just in the sense that this sounds like songs that could be on morbid stuff. Um, that said, the interesting moments on this record for me are the ones where the band gets weird and ambitious, and it's really interesting and really big and awesome. And mainly, I just love the fact that this is a 35 minute long uh, record that does one thing and one thing only, and that's kick your fucking ass. Uh, well, some of my favorite moments on Morbid Stuff are the moments like uh, Full Blown Meltdown, yeah. which are just fucking thrash metal songs. And mm-hmm. that's basically the name of the game here. And from, I mean, the opener, my favorite song on here, Totally Fine, which is, I think, a, both a quintessential pup song and just a really great um, anthemic slamming track where the riff on it is just fucking tasty every riff on here honestly is just it's enormous it's clobbering and it's fucking cool as hell Mm. and for somebody who likes to just thrash about to shit like this i am wholly satisfied with how you know sharp and metallic it is and sounds and totally fine it's just the exact brand of irreverent humor combined with emotionality that i love pup for and then you go into robot likes a uh, uh, robot writes a love song which i think is a really interesting songwriting uh, experiment that basically uses a metaphor of somebody creating a robot as to for like projection of an x onto a new uh relationship that you are currently enduring uh and honestly it again just kind of kicks ass the the weird sort of part of it is sort of at the beginning but the rest of it is like you know it's a pup song it's a bit more measured but i i still think that it o- obeys uh the core tenets of what this band do very very well and uh but you also have songs like waiting which again the sort of anthemic almost stadium rock gang vocals on here are just an absolute blast to listen to um, I love how, I mean, this song basically could be about the narrator of Fight Club and uh, fucking Marla Singer. Uh, it, 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 it's a striking amount of that, that uh, vibe similarities you get from a lot here. of um, relationship songs that Stephen Babcock writes across all pop records. Oh, I yeah. Um, just, just two people who are unequivocally fucked up losers um, and the the complications thereof. Like, I love the the spiteful bitterness that comes from, like, every 
aspect of one's life like on morbid stuff there's songs that are just about trying to improve yourself so you can stick it to your shitty ex i was just gonna say one of my favorite pop songs on which is on the sleep of the, the sleep is over the dream is over uh is the song doubts where it's just like uh he's talking about how like his life is has fallen apart and um now that i've got nothing you're having your doubts like we're as soon as there's the security associated with being with someone has been taken away then all of a sudden the emotional connection there mysteriously disappears and one of my favorite things about Stephen and the way he writes and particularly the way he writes about relationships is that he has this sense of real bitter snottiness to people who have wronged him or to that kind of thing but it never comes across as kind of like uh ugly in a way where you kind of feel a bit weird about it he always does it in a way that feels like incredibly intensely relatable he's and also on the joke yeah and he's also like very self-effacing as well in the yeah. same in the same process so it's like you get he just gives off the vibes of uh, extremely relatable vibes i think in terms of like just being pissed off at people who fucked with you but also like pissed off at how you feel like you're not allowed to be and pissed off, as pissed off as you are so um I, and that's true that's always been a constant in his writing and it's true here too so i appreciate i i love steven as a writer i think that the way he writes about these sort of fundamental emotions of like relationships and stuff and, and self-doubt are a key to the appeal of pop and the presentation i feel like is in keeping with that is that it has like the you know the the four chord sort of sweet thing and it's like presented as like this really corporate thing it's like this really indulgent artistic uh endeavor when it ends up being their like shortest record oh that God. is just kind of full oh of bangers and like it, there, there's something very um uh cheeky about the way they are presenting this to be this fucking weird thing and it's just them kind of you know, variations on the same sort of in, indulgent theme, but still while doing what they've always been able to do. Mm -hmm. And then they have some sort of songs where they, they pair back a little bit and they get to songs like um, City or uh, Scorpion Hill on Morbid Stuff. You have songs like Cutting Off the Corners, which are a little bit more, I mean, like they're more inclined to be uh, balladesque and emotional. Um, and but of course, uh, one of my favorite songs on here too, uh, other than uh, Grim Reaping, which I do think is very good, is uh, Pup the Band Incorporated's Filing for Bankruptcy, Going Out with a Bang, um, absolutely just kind of a blast the whole way through. And really, that's kind of the, the dichotomy of the record for me is that this alternates between some of the hardest and biggest and most fun songs the band have ever made and some of the most creative songs they've ever made. And then songs that are just them doing what they did on The Dream Is Over and Morbid Stuff. And there's nothing wrong with those songs. I like those songs a lot. It's just that I feel like this particular album might be, basically I would compare this almost with the trajectory of something like Green Day, uh, which I did bring up before, weirdly enough, but this is in a more direct way in that the self-titled is kind of their 39 smooth, and then the dream is over could be seen as their dookie, and then morbid stuff can be seen as their insomniac, and that the dream is over is kind of their breakout record that got them really popular. It's generally the one that people regard as being uh, the best or sort of like the height of, of what they've done in like a very pure, raw, snotty, bratty sense. And then morbid stuff is kind of the kind of the, the, the darker, weirder, uh, younger brother album to the dream is over. And then after after that, you have albums like Nimrod and shit, where Green Day decided to get really fucking weird for no reason, just because they could. And this is an album that's a lot like that. Mm -hmm. However, the feels like the commitment is a bit, I won't say scattershot, just because it, it makes, like, in my opinion, seem like it's a lot more negative than it is. It's just that I want them to go, like, I feel like they are capable of going, like, full American idiot and making some, like, weird, big, bombastic thing. And this just isn't quite that. It's sometimes kind of that, but, like, and those are some of my favorite moments on the record. But its lack of commitment is a bit of a problem for me in settling and reckoning with its identity as an album over overall and so I really like how loud and aggro and cool it is but I also just kind of think that it's 
missing a little bit of something that maybe if the band had worked on it a little bit longer or they had just sort of decided what it wanted to be other than just kind of, you know, bangers, it, it could have been a little bit more. And maybe it's the stepping stone to something. Maybe this is transitional to something that could be grander and bigger and more ambitious and good, do that. Because frankly, with morbid stuff and the dream is over, you've done that as well as you're ever going to do it, frankly. I don't think you're going to do that any better. So go on to be weirder and more ambitious, but, you know, really commit to it next time. If, you know, you're asking me, which I don't know why you would, you're successful, but, you know, just my opinion. <laughs> no, for, for, for sure. To me, one of the most uh, enduring and even appealing aspects of Pup have always been the sense that they have this meta aspect to their identity as a band where they will kind of wryly comment on being in a band, the experience of being in a band, like Pup as a uh, concept. And like a lot of Stephen's songwriting will be based around that. And there'll be a lot of nods and winks to that. And there's a sense oh, of- Oh, you're selling insurance. That's really great. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking yeah, but... tell me you're still giving away a job in two years. And so that like funny. the direction that Pup go in terms of the concept and the idea for this record is not new. Uh, and nor should it really even be all that surprising. It's kind of the logical extension of the winks and nods of previous records. I mean, The Dream is Over, the name of that record famously comes from a piece of advice that, or not an advice, but a recommendation that Stephen was given by his doctor when he kind of tore one of his vocal cords was that, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to sing in a punk band anymore. And, you know, then he said, The Dream is Over. And then Morbid Stuff, I mean, the title of that album is like, you know, it's it's a very postmodern title. Like, it's a very much of a winky commentary on you know what kind of kind of band that pop are and the kind of music that they make and the kind of themes that they're interested in and so Stephen to me has always been a songwriter or Stefan I'm not sure how to say it has always been a songwriter that is really preoccupied with these things and when you get songs that are written about um, particular experiences or things that he's going through you don't really feel like as you might with other bands that he's writing about a generic experience that he's kind of pers giving personality to, but he's actually, you feel like you're reading his diary at a certain point. And he has a very personal touch to his writing that makes it deeply relatable. Um, and that's always been one of the biggest appeals of Pup to me of this band. In 2016, The Dream Is Over is one of the albums I spent, I listened to the most that year. I played that album so much. I remember when the first thing I heard from that album was um, they released uh, uh, If This Tour Doesn't Kill You, I Will and DVP as like twin singles because those songs kind of run into each other. And like, If This Tour Doesn't Kill You, I Will is again, like it's a very meta song. It's a song about like mm -hmm. how fucking annoying it can be to be in a band. And it's like taking those inner band tensions and actually using that as material to, to fuel one of your most like insanely awesome and, and killer songs and i will never forget the fucking moment where that riff on that song first comes in and i the first time i heard that i was like fuck the shit rules and to me like that running into dbp is still the peak of this band and um i love that album to, to death and i can play that front of that anytime morbid stuff is almost as good for me um I love that record too. Yeah, I have like the such exact a... same experience you did with The Dream Is Over with Morbid Stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's, exact it's just where, where you come in, I guess, on this, in this journey. And um, mm -hmm. it's a great refinement of what Pup are good at. It very much feels like, you know, um, taking the things that make Pup a fundamentally great pop punk slash punk band and just really sanding off the edges and making them sound like as good as they possibly can, um, which is great. And this album's interesting. It's like a deliberate sort of left turn, I think, away from what that progression would imply, but also like a doubling down of this meta aspect to Pup, this idea of mm -hmm. Pup the band. Again, like as you have in that, um, in the title of the album, uh, which is also their Twitter handle, you know, it, it's a sense to with which Pup are kind of doing that typical thing that successful bands do where you kind of react to a certain extent against your fame and you react to a certain extent against the things that tastemakers like about you because you start to realize oh i'm a successful and critically acclaimed band that blogs like pitchfork or whoever love and you start to become uh if not outright uh resentful of then at least like distanced from the fact like the fact that you're being embraced for these certain things that you perceive as being at a disconnect from 
what makes your band meaningful to you. So like a punk band becoming embraced by a multimedia conglomerate, you know, websites and stuff, you know, th- that creates a disconnect. Like, oh, well, what are pup anymore? What are we? Are we this raw punk band that this speaks to this very like uh, true and, and relatable experience for people who have like fucking no money and shitty childhoods and shitty jobs and shitty relationships? Are we that? Or are we this, you know, pitchfork friendly rock band that has this kind of festival ready audience of, of and maybe of people that are maybe more uh, middle class, people that are maybe more uh, younger and, and maybe less the kind of audience that we were getting in our earlier days. And so I, I can see that having created this identity crisis for Pup in terms of what are we, how can we continue our development and our ascendance, but also like feel like we're staying true to ourselves. And that d- d- dilemma, which I've very much projected onto Pup, I don't know that that's exactly the process, but it feels very much from this record like it is has I think dictated a lot of what the unraveling of Pup the Band turns out to be. It's like saying fuck you to the people who came on board late and to the blogs and stuff that celebrated or that kind of glommed on to them as kind of like a cool punk band and also like really trying to give something to the hardcore fans that's you know a slice of what they want from Pup, the, the, the intensity, the heaviness and I think a lot of this is the dichotomy of this is represented beautifully by hiring Peter Cadis, who is the most blog indie rock, you know, media conglomerate friendly indie rock producer, right? He makes the national sound like a million bucks. He makes Gang of Youth sound like the national. <laughs> um, he, he makes these bands have this sound that gives them a certain appeal. And so they use Peter Cadis, they hire him. Um, and then they, what they do is they use him to create a record that sounds very ugly. It sounds very distorted. It sounds very compressed. It has this rawness to it. It honestly sounds more like a Dave Fridman produced album than a Peter Cadis fr- produced album. And I like a lot of uh, records that Dave Fridman has produced. Uh, sometimes f- for me, that compression, that heft, and that just like loudness that he gives to bands can be really amazing, like on uh, Embryonic by the Flaming Lips, which is an incredibly loud album mm. uh, and incredibly compressed oh, yeah. record. Love and Embryonic. like um, uh, The Woods by Slater Kinney, for instance, both records where he gives that mm-hmm. aesthetic to it. And then you have uh, records like uh, The Last Baroness album where maybe the compression goes a little bit too far and maybe starts to suck a little bit of the lifeblood out of the songs. Now, I don't think that the production style on this record sours the album to the extent that it does in the case of Baroness. Um, But I do feel like for me personally, that approach to really making this record sound as super compressed and super like uh, laden with noise and just really like you're getting a band that are playing in a really small room and the mics are just like really right up there and everything's kind of dialed up and it works and with the concept that they're going for it works with this idea of a band deconstructing in front of you and a lot of the cheeky nods and jokes and stuff that Stefan includes in, into the little interlude tracks in here and the, the closing track I think work to accentuate that and um But at the same time, for me, it feels like Pup are kind of shying away from, or even like, not even shying away from, but like actively trying to disguise a lot of the things that make them really strong as a band. Actually actively trying to kind of like bury them underneath production decisions and aesthetic choices that just don't quite land it for me. I think all of this is kind of neatly encapsulated with Robot Writes a Love Song, which was also the lead single for this record. Uh, And to me is probably my personally, the thing here that I feel the most distance from and the most feels to me the most grating um, because it it feels so preoccupied with the aesthetic that the record is going for that it it, it loses so much of the verve and the joy and the life affirming and, 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 charismatic stuff that that Stephen's so good at doing there's seeds of classic pup in there but it feels buried beneath walls of of unpleasant production sound decisions and that sort of meta reflexive self-awareness that's kind of just lost all control to a certain extent um that said I think totally fine is a banger. I think it is a, gr- I wish this was the lead single to be honest, because to me, it is the clear standout on the record. Uh, it sh- showcases everything Pup do s- super well. It does, I think, 
it is hindered, I think, slightly by that production sound from me, but uh, it is still a great song. I really enjoy it. I also want to shout out a deep cut that I really love, which is the song Cutting Off the Corners, which Jake, you shouted out as kind of like a little bit of a, um, one of the less intense moments on this record where there's a little bit more sort of space and you get sort of Stephen expanding a little bit. And I really appreciated that coming in at this point. To me, this is an absolute standout on the record. I love the vocal performance here. Uh, Stephen and the band have absolutely not at all lost their talent for hooks either. There are great hooks all over this record. Songs like Matilda, songs like Waiting really stand out for me, really have that memorableness to them. I'm also quite fond Waiting. of the song. Yeah, fuck. I'm also quite fond of the song Relentless to a certain extent as well, which is has quite an emotional potency to it in terms of how it deals with the sort of nihilistic state that you know being mentally unwell can put you in. And it feels very much like a continuation of a of a very emotionally compelling theme that uh, Stefan and the band have returned to heaps. And um, it also has this sort of, these a few musical elements to it that feel a little bit less punky and a little bit more sort of like, not even emo-y, but just kind of like have this little bit more of a sort of uh, dour alt-rock edge that feels slightly new to them that I really like. And so, yeah, I'm a little bit mixed overall. This, I think, is not a bad album absolutely not it's just not the pup record for me i don't think but it also feels like the kind of album they needed to get out of their system based on the identity crisis moment that they're existing within of how do we keep things fresh how do we satisfy the different audiences that we gather but also how do we stay true to ourselves and so in a lot of ways it feels like this is a clearing shit out that pup needed to do um, like a band therapy session for instance it's like you know, it's it's like the the this album is like the musical equivalent of Metallica's some kind of monster documentary. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way, but also kind of in a way that ex explains why I'm not super into it. Um, that said, I love the Green Day comparison, Jake, because to me, their progression is very much like Green Day's 90s progression. And I do agree. They very much have it in them to level up and become and make a record like American Idiot. And the really interesting thing will be to see whether Pup do that because they're at the exact juncture in that career trajectory where you would expect that to be the next thing they do. So they will either, I think, mm -hmm. do that. They'll either make that leap or they will go further down the rabbit hole of trying to alienate people. And I think that even if they do that, that could still create some really interesting records that I really, really enjoy. Uh, because pups staying true to themselves are ultimately all I could ever ask them to do, whether whichever direction that means going in. But um, it does feel like a bit of a stopgap. It does feel like a little bit of a unrealized concept to a certain extent. But I am glad Pup got it out of their system. I'm glad that it's connected with other people as well. Um, and I definitely will be returning to certain songs on this record. I... <sighs> Pup are one of those bands where I, I get really mad. I often get really mad that I can't see a lot of bands live because of where I live, but I'm particularly mad that I can't see Pup uh, play live because unless they decide to get super, 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 super sell out and come to be able to afford to come to New Zealand, because I have no doubt that even the songs I don't care for on this record will absolutely slay in a live setting because they'll be able to shed all of the aspects that I don't care for that are leathered into um, the record itself. Uh, so yeah, that's just ultimately where I'm at. It's one of the most unpleasant places to be in with any record where you like a lot of the ideas and the musicality, but there's just re these superficial aspects of it that hold you back. But I can't lie. Uh, that's just where I'm at with um, this album, unfortunately. Yes, I will say I, I have a similar reaction to you in that I don't think the writing is at all the problem on here. I think a lot of these songs are quite witty, have quite good hooks. Like those, those to me, the writing, the hookiness, the emotional inflections of this record, that's not at all what I, I think is lacking here. What I think needs some work, yeah, is mostly the production, which I just the way it's compressed to me sounds very digital it sounds very computery very synthetic to me i i think there's a certain like 
vitality and lifeblood that this kind of production has sucked out of this kind of punk music that I think it really needs if you're going to create the most abrasive punk shit possible. It, it just sounds too computery to my ears. I think the mix is just way too even. No one thing really takes charge of these songs. It, it sounds like, August, yeah. that if we were to put your review into five words, then it, you could simply just say, Robot Writes a Love Song. Ah. You, you've kind of already elaborated on a lot of the ideas I wanted to say. I do want to say, I think the song Relentless, quite good. I liked that song a fair bit. A couple of the other moments, fun too. It's just the way it's all done kind of takes me out of the experience and I was just unfortunately left with a bit of a it, it feels like empty calories this album you know I just didn't get much from it even though it tasted good in the moment at times yummy I just feel like I'm walking away with nothing sadly um, uh, although it's the truly their it, discography is supposedly good. So it's truly the KFC to morbid stuff's McDonald's. Um, just no, I forget I said that. I, I want to say I forgot one thing. I forgot to say is that one thing that is true of this album, as with every pop album, is that it made me laugh multiple times. Steve Hunt is very funny, uh, and I want to particularly shout out the last track here, which I think is both the funniest and the hardest on the album. I really yeah. love how just intense this gets towards the end. There's some great riff, great riffs on the album in multiple tracks, but particularly at the end here, they really stick the landing. Um, it still has all the same sort of issues that hold me back from loving other songs more, but it is a moment where I feel like structurally the album has a satisfying finish in, in that sense. And I do like the lines about... Um, I do like the lines about the free shoes and the critical acclaim. Um, and um, uh, no, the, 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 real, the best lyric on this album is, I sold those Nikes, I bought a new guitar case. It's called Protecting Your Investments, which I th which made <laughs> me laugh out loud. I, I really like it. And that. it's his delivery too, that like it, it makes it really like unique sounding and it's like really well sung and all that stuff. But like, it's also perfect for comedy. Just the way he kind of like snottily says, like, called him protecting your investments. Yeah, he, he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's really great. Funny. He's great at, at, at um, really knowing how to sell every line that he writes as a vocalist. Um, One of the first lines on Morbid Stuff is just, your songs are getting way too literal. Yeah, and right there, everything you need to know about Stefan as a writer is how absorbed he is with how his music is being received and how he is as an artist as well we've talked about a lot of art i think a lot of artists on this channel who have that sense of self-absorption and self-concern and how sometimes it can really sink the music especially when they become totally absorbed by it but to stefan's credit while i think it does hinder this record to some extent he is usually able to find a way to make that self-obsession funny and that i think goes a long way uh, especially and also considering the fact that you know, at the end of the day, Papa is still a really raw, back to basics punk band, you know, and, and so they don't necessarily get hurt as much from having that sort of level of, of self-concern as maybe a, a more ornate band might be if they get super into it. So, and they're still like a, a relatively new band as well. So uh, they've got a lot of life in them still. <laughs> Let's move into our favorite tracks and ratings then. Uh, we go in reverse order this time, I suppose. Uh, my three favorite tracks on the record are Totally Fine, Relentless, and Cutting Off the Corners. My least favorite track is probably Grim Reaping um, or Robot Writes a Love Song. And my rating for this album is going to be a 5 out of 10. Anyway, um, Morgan, I think, agrees with me. Morgan's favorite tracks are Habits, uh, Pup the Band, Ellipses, which I, I, I'm assuming means the last song was recorded. He was and, filing for bankruptcy. Yeah, and, 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 and Matilda. And Morgan's least favorite is uh, Robot Writes a Love Song. And Morgan gives it a six. Um, August, your turn. For me, it's going to be favorite is Relentless, Matilda, and Waiting. Least favorite, I have to agree, is Robot Writes a Love Song. I, I cannot tell whether 10. you're from like 
the deep south or whether you're from like word. eastern europe <laughs> yes my three favorite songs on here are totally fine robot writes a love song and waiting um my least favorite song on here yeah, i guess grim reaping maybe um and i give it an eight heal yeah so that gives us our second um, flat single digit average, which is a 6.0 for the unraveling of Pop the Band. Sure, wait, is it our third now in this the recording session? Of our sanity. Yes, now it is time for the unraveling of our sanity with the third oh. album we're going to be reviewing today, which oh. is. The Red Hot Chili Peppers unlimited love that's right you heard right so much love incredible quant vast vast quantities of love oh, what are, you fucking, is that the oh, david lynch quote he is just gonna love all over you for fucking 100 no, minutes i got it wrong the lynch quote is massive ma i can't even try to do his voice massive <laughs> massive quantities of love so let's talk about the Red Hot Chili Peppers for the second time on this podcast. Those of you who oh have been God, around the, the block second are bad band. <laughs> might remember when the three of us who are right here right now uh, were talking about the Red Hot Chili Peppers Blood Sugar Sex Magic for its 30th anniversary. Oh, that that album. Sugar Sex Sex. And I don't remember a lot of the specific things that were said, but I, I remember the tone was very much like, I was making apologies for liking the, that record to the moderate degree that I like it. I mean, I think I have it at a five out of 10. Um, and it was a typical example of me, uh, of typical me, uh, making excuses while you were just like, it's bad. And you know, you had a point, you know, like there are a lot of things about that record that are still pretty unsufferable to this day. Um, and it's probably not even my favorite. Like the unbearable, infinite, soul crushing length yeah, which is a thing that's true of most Peppers records. And and look, for my very lukewarm defensive parts of that album, it's probably not even my favorite Peppers record, which is One Hot Minute. And that is 100% because of Dave Navarro, who I have a real, real fondness for. I love Jane's addiction and his addition to that uh, era of the band is great. I wish I had remembered to shout that I had out. No earlier. fucking idea he was on that album. Yeah, he, he's the guitarist because Frusciante <laughs> left after um, Magic and then he rejoined after One Hot Minute and then he left again, I think. Wait, yeah. Yeah, and then he left again, I think, after Stadium Arcadium. So I wish everyone so. in this band left it except Flea. <laughs> Imagine if it was just, just him like, playing bass just for Flea. like a so half an hour. Allow me to. Uh, indulge you all with a hot take here which is to say that this uh, new album Unlimited Love is the best Peppers album since One Hot Minute and it sucks I mean I'm it's never awesome. gonna know it, it's not good but <laughs> one thing I will say is that um, we had a slight change of pace for the Peppers with their last record 2016's The Getaway where I think that was the first record that they made in I want to say 30 years without Rick Rubin behind the boards. They were instead, I believe, produced by Danger Mouse on that record. And also notably, it oh, was... Oh, no. It wasn't really? a bad collaboration. Like, the most notable thing about The Getaway is that it, it produced the single that was impossible to ignore in that year if you had to listen to the radio at any point, which is the song Dark Necessities, which is still mid as hell, but whatever. Um, but The Getaway... The well, getaways... Most Red Hot Chili Peppers singles are mid as hell, so if not worse. So the getaway's you know. one saving grace was that uh, it was, I think, the shortest Peppers album in several decades. It was like 50 minutes long. Um, and, and that was like it, it felt like uh, though they had moved into that stage of their career, that other legacy bands like U2 are in, where it's like you just put out an album every five or six years minimum because you don't need to. You don't need to make a record to tour anyway. But you just do it occasionally. Metallica are in this stage as well. You just do it occasionally when you feel like it. And so I foolishly, I had thought that maybe they had the one lesson they had learned from the getaway was that while they clearly don't have much inspiration at any point anymore they at least can see that the whole you know filling up the fucking cd thing that they indulged in throughout the 90s is not really and also and then of course the utter bloat 
of Stadium Arcadium is not really something they need to indulge themselves in anymore. And it's not really something that's worth bothering no. with. And of Absolutely. course, here There's come a successful enough band. That here come, gonna sell here come the Red Hot Chili Peppers again no to prove what. me wrong by releasing a 73 minute album uh, called Unlimited Love. Uh, and the first thing I have to say is that um, it's not unlimited. It's 73 minutes of love. And it's not the kind of love that makes you feel very fuzzy inside, if I'm perfectly honest with you. It's the kind of love that makes you feel like you want to pretend that a stranger is an old friend so that you can get out of the situation that you're currently in without having to just run away. Uh, it's that kind of love, I think, that you experience uh, while listening to Unlimited Love. It is, of course, the first album with Freshanti since Stadium Arcadium. He was um, he fucked off after that record and they had Josh Glenhofer, who's not an amazing guitarist, but I've always felt was kind of a little bit underappreciated because he wasn't for Shanty. And I've always felt that for Shanty's kind of B tier anyway. But anyway, for Shanty's back, long live the king. And of course, for Shanty's return, because of course, for Shanty is one of the greatest guitarists of all time. If you ask fucking any Rolling Stone reader, of course, that means that for Shanty's return is going to herald the invigoration of the Peppers again, the sense with which the Peppers are going to have the lifeblood cummed back into them. And no, I mean, oh. that's not that's not true at all. Uh, for Shanty is doing what for Shanty has always done, which is laid down some pretty nice tones and do very fucking little in addition to that. Um, for, well, the one thing I will say for um, for this record, uh, and, and it is a return to collaborating with Rick Rubin as well, it should be noted. And so the one thing I will say is that Rick, Rick Rubin, we've talked about Rubin on this podcast before as well. And they talked about, they had a really uh, interesting conversation that uh, Stephen and Ian had about Rubin on the latest IndieCast as well, where it's like, he may be the most inconsistent producer of all time because he can make your record sound fucking amazing. Uh, if if he wants to and he can also make your record sound fucking awful and maybe that's something to do with what the band want maybe that's something to do with his own weird tendencies dude's a fucking hippie um i want to make this one really loud well here's the thing so uh, i think the fame the most infamous thing about production when you think of red hot chili peppers is californication and the way that that record is maybe the biggest successful album to be a victim of the loudness wars uh, which is this increasing tendency and popular thing in production to make everything sound as be mastered as loud as possible. And the result of that is a record that is fucking unlistenable. <laughs> Californication is one of the worst sounding successful platinum records ever released in the last 50 years of music. Oh, and don't ask me why. It just is. I mean, listen to it. It's fucking awful. And it's still probably one of their best <laughs> albums it just sounds dreadful and so one thing i will say is with rick rubin it's like having an abusive parent or not an abusive parent it's like having an alcoholic parent where every night you just don't know what you're going to get you don't know whether it's going to be a good night or whether you're going to get clubbed and so what i will say is that rubin makes this record sound reasonably good i think and maybe you'll disagree with me on that. Who knows? I, I think this record is in the upper tier of Chili Peppers records generally, as I kind of forecasted earlier. But I also think that part of that is the fact that it sounds pretty good. Uh, there certainly are a lot of Chili Peppers records that sound worse than this. So I'll give it that. Uh, there is a great sense of presence of each member of the band on this record. Uh, Flea is still doing his utmost. Uh, he doesn't really phone it in either. There are a few moments in this record where the songs will just be dreadfully boring, but he will be just like, he'll be doing the most extra bass part for no reason possible. It's not necessary, but he will just be doing it. And that's I, one of the I, I genuinely believe that it's improvised because they gave him nothing to do. So he just decided in the studio recording to be like, I'm just going to fuck it. Yeah. And the other and thing then, I will say is uh, I've always felt as well that one of the, the most underappreciated member of the red hot chili peppers is actually the drummer chad smith who i won't put up in the upper tier pantheon of drummers or anything like that but when you have a funk yes. rock yeah. funk pop band like the chili peppers the rhythm section are always going to be your the thing that hold you together and i think that for all the love that flea gets chad smith is underappreciated for how well he holds that up too 
Um, so shout out to those frat guys. boy ass name for a frat boy ass band. What's kind of funny about this new record is that the least compelling. There's a point there. The, mo- the most funny that, thing about this record yeah. is that the least compelling and least we'll like there. notable presence on the album is actually John Frusciante, despite the fact that yeah. he's coming in. And Weird. not only is he laying down guitar, he's laying down synth tracks, Mellotron tracks. He's doing vocals as well. He's having a he, heavy time. He does so he much. Rock, he, rock. he does so much, and yet he does so little. He does. It's absurd. Go off. <laughs> All of the bells and whistles. And it's just like, wow, damn. They, they really. Put it, the, and the they amount to a window into this album. Oh, yeah. Really, just I mean, like fucking. There are points of this where it's just like they, they genuinely try to sound like they're like a surf rock Steely Dan, and I just want to. I, yeah, look, no, um, this is a thing. So, the Chili Peppers brand of this kind of like funk pop thing has always been very kind of watered down. In fact, I think you could make the case that the Chili Peppers, that the funk aspect of the Chili Peppers that they kind of became known for with. Uh, blood sugar sex magic it's kind of absent in like almost all of their most successful music if you think about like you think about all of the really big huge pepper songs they're not funk rock tracks i mean i mean under the bridge is like example number one of not a funk song yeah i mean like give it away maybe is is like the most funk heavy that any successful peppers single ever got and you know that's fine like they have some songs that were re- that have been relatively successful. They have some radio songs that I like. Um, they have some things that I enjoy about them. But the fundamental fact about the Chili Peppers is that they kind of are a nothing band. Like they're just not really enough of any particular musical thing to really feel like they qualify for whatever that thing is. At least not anymore. And I, but I really don't think I, th- I really think this is true of basically everything they've done since um, the since California after Californication maybe even including that record and I mean it's the same it's ironic that we talked about Blood Sugar Sex Magic in our 1991 retrospective and then we also talked about U2's Arctung Baby in a similar period because they have kind of had similar career trajectories where regardless of whether or not you enjoy their peak era stuff they've kind of settled into this groove of being one of the biggest bands in the world who make music that just sounds like a blank sheet of A4 like that's just like, <laughs> where they, they completely sand down anything that might have remotely approached the idiosyncrasy of, of the music they became known for and they simply become a template and you project whatever you want onto that template and unlimited but love Riley, is... surely the band have some lyrical interests throughout their career no all their songs are about california and pussy so <laughs> here we have we get to or Anthony both Kiedis. at the same time. Anthony Kiedis and his lyrical acumen, which is like <laughs> it's somewhere between like beat poetry, like sixties beat poetry, Allen Ginsberg, <laughs> and like an AI that has been fed nothing but porn scripts. It's somewhere between that, um, or, or, or between those two things. Uh, there's a song on this record, and with it, I don't feel like there's <laughs> just that scene. Is there a song there's on a this song. record? There, there's not many songs on this record that we are talking about because there's not many songs on this record that actually exist. But there, there's the like that does. three. You know this this album. You can describe it as like a Schrodinger's cat of like when you're not. A, observing these songs directly they might not exist <laughs> no one knows whether the songs in this record exist or not until they open the box um anyway prove it uh so the one of the one of the few songs in this record that does i think undeniably exist is the song poster child <laughs> which we have to talk about oh, God, this song sucks so much jake you made a great you tweeted a great what did you say about the song and how it sounds on twitter you said a great thing but i can't remember oh god i don't remember i, I think you, I, you, I think i i was delirious it was like three in the you morning compared it i'm to, going to look it up right now you compared it to we didn't start the fire i think which is yeah a, that's a, right i said it's like if we didn't start the fire but like if it's whoever did it whoever was writing it was like did ketamine and some other dumb shit 
Like, let me fucking <laughs> look for this shit. It's like we didn't start the fire if fucking Billy Joel was someone threw a rock at his head in the middle of the writing process. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> um, so this is an interesting song because to talk about because of the it, it kind of bridges the two aspects of Red Hot Chili Peppers that I guess the most notable, which is like how fucking stupid they can sound musically, like just how much of a parody of themselves they can be as a funk pop band. And also just how Anthony Kiedis spouts the most, the biggest fucking load of horse shit you've ever heard in your life, <laughs> lyrically. Like the word salad <laughs> is like, it's too kind because it suggests something that might taste good. So I think... There's nothing could be more entertaining, I think, than just if I were to just read these lyrics to you. So I'm just going to do Please. that now. Mel and Mel and Richard Hell were dancing at the Taco Bell. When someone heard a rebel yell, I think it was an infidel. Adamant and Robert Plant, the banter of a sycophant, enlisted by Ulysses Grant to record at the record plant. Islamabad, miracle, miracle. Islamabad Spiritual. Is- Islamabad is on the nod, Havana and the riot squad. And if you want to be a mod, you'll have to meet me at the quad. And then, of course, you have the uh, timeless refrain. You got the best of my loco. I'll take the rest of your showboat. Damn. Anthony Kiedis really abusing that A-B rhyme scheme. Parliament's atomic... Well, no, this is A-A-A-A-A. That's the rhyme scheme. Parliament's uh, yes. atomic dog. The hat's that, that filling was up with fog. Grade. Talk about the life and death of every penny analog. The 70s were such a win, singing the Led Zeppelin. Lizzie looking mighty thin. The Thompsons had another twin. <laughs> <laughs> what? My daughter won the lottery. The, le- the numbers never thought of me. Ramones had a lobotomy, so spin me like your pottery. <laughs> I... Okay, first of all, last night I found I scrolled up long enough to say I was just like, what it's what if we didn't start the fire was boring. But I also say uh, anything that isn't boring is worthy of a brief, huh? And then you're wondering why this band has fans until Kitas has a line about tongue punching sooner girl. <laughs> and then I had included a picture of the little gif of Kermit the Frog hung on a ceiling fan. Because when you're in track nine, that's how you feel. You're just fucking asleep. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. A funky feast of Sandinista. Neon mono Mona Lisa. <laughs> Judas Priest, the sweet barista. Mother Lode was named Teresa. Bubble gum, I come to Zoom. North Day, Red China, Johnny Ray, South Pacific, Walter Winter, Joe DiMaggio. Exactly. Th- this is why your comparison is so spot on. Bubble gum, I come bazooka. Dirty Dan, Dean, and DeLuca. Smoked banana in your hookah. Now I know the brand is RVCA. Okay. He just breaks the lot, the rhyme there for no reason. For no reason. Bernie like... Mac and Caddyshack were dusty as the bric a brac. And if you ask me for the time, I'll tell you that the future's back. Steve Miller and Duran Duran, a joker dancing in the sand. Van Morrison, the astral man, a festival they have in can. <laughs> Speaking of Chico and the man, the silence of a certain lamb. MC5 kick out the jam, a poncho full of contraband. Dairy Queen was on the scene, the Every Kid Teen magazine. <laughs> the Motorhead and Mr. Clean, my piston needed Valvoline. This is like the kind of song where he just is going to like randomly drop the N word in there somewhere. Cream magazine, a love supreme, the ballad of a Billie Jean. And now we know the status quo, but God will never save the Queen. Dave Mushigan, Copenhagen, or Dave Mushigan, Copenhagen, cowboy ghost of Ronald Reagan, dollar save was Flavor Flavin, cosmic rays of Carl Sagan, hammer fist, a double kissed, unlisted number purple mist, the chubby checker do the twist, and everyone's a narcissist. The waterbed was taking meds, Devo with their hats of red, a fatty for the natty dread, a pocket full of talking heads. Maya's making paper planes, mm. addiction to the days of Jane's, my slurpees made of purple rain, ten fingers in the lion's mane, 
Giant squid, <sighs> karate kid, Sid Vicious, and the Katie did the planet that we must forbid. The English beat are in oh my Madrid. god. And that's it. I, I promise I'm done. This, this is like this is this is like listening to like this is like listening to someone try and write like a passage by like Don DeLillo if they had only read like I don't know fucking pornography I don't there's no like this is a perfect encapsulation of maybe this album's most bewildering problem for me which is the fact that the lyrics are awful and I know you're just like why did you go into a Red Hot Chili Peppers album and expect the lyrics to not be good and like look there is nothing about this album instrumentally that stands out. There's nothing about this. It's like everyone rises to the astonishing level of competency. So the lyrics are, by definition, the only thing you can pay attention to. And they're nonsense. And I don't care. Just like, they're supposed to be wallpaper. They're chosen for their <laughs> poetic qualities. The way that Anthony Akitas delivers them. And I, look, if you're the type of person who sits there in your bed, puts on your best pair of headphones and listens to Anthony Akitas say, aquatic mouth dance for five minutes, then you're that type of person. But you know what? Some of us like listening to good music. I don't care what quality the lyricism plays in, 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 in anything. Like, I like the Mar- Volta. I don't care what mi- lyrics mean all the time. If you want an but earnest like, interrogation, have some of, fucking standards. If you want an earnest interrogation of of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you're in the wrong fucking place. Actually, you're probably in the right place and the wrong place at the same time. Um, I just want to sh- say this is the kind of dance. this is the kind of record that blends into the background so much, and then occasionally will just kind of snap you back to reality as you kind of very vividly and clearly hear Anthony Kiedis say something that just makes you want to throw no. up. No, yeah, it's 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 like it's like when you get mind goblins, you know. <laughs> and I, the reason I say that is the specific moment in this record where I was comatose, and then there was he just said something, and it just like clattered through the fog of my brain so vividly that I shot upwards. And that was the moment in She's a Lover where he's like, I just want to lick your face. And I, I was completely tuned out from the album at this point. And then he just says that. And it's like this fog clears and I suddenly am seeing very clearly and I'm hearing him say that. And then within five seconds, I'm gone again. And, and 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 the rest of the record is like that. Um, I, 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 ha- I had other examples of things he says, and I've actually fucking forgotten what they are. So well, <laughs> here look, we are. There's, there's a thing that I do in order to more cogently put thoughts together about uh, records like this is that I'll listen to an album and a couple of times and then like the most recent album listen like relative close to when we record that's when I'll rate the tracks on rate your music if I need to like develop my thoughts on each one because then I can kind of remember what I was doing and thinking uh in in doing this and I I remember that for about I'd say the first I'll, I'll say impressively that I I can probably go through she's a lover um, after that, Ooh, like song I, eight I, of a hundred, I don't remember anything. So I'm just I try going... to comment on everything, <laughs> no matter what. Talk about the flow of the album, the pacing. <laughs> after that, it's static. So, I don't remember a oh, goddamn it's, thing. It's like other exactly. Than the fact, what what? If we're gonna talk about lyrics for a brief moment, I I would like to. Ju- the Great Apes. <laughs> One of the better songs musically on the record, I would say. I mean, probably, but also... I just want the Great <laughs> Apes to be free. I just want <laughs> the Great Apes to be free. Fucking Harambe, man. <laughs> What's great is that it's, it sounds... Just, sure, it's a song about... He's a boxcar None of the other like lyrics have anything to do with apes. Sky. It's just... It's nothing. Nope. 
That's all mean. of my love and half my kisses. Superstar, don't do the dishes. I just want the great apes to be free. Come on now, you lazy cowboy. Heads or tails, but not right now, boy. I just want the great apes to be free. Anthony, if they're apes, why are you getting a cowboy? Tell me. Look, this is See, even you know, if I'm we those are it. for cows. Even Look, if I'm we are thinking apes, about this. Even if yeah. we accept for a second that Anthony's shtick is just word salad and that like that's kind of part of the appeal of just like the rant, like if we just accept that for a second, then how does that jive with the moments on the record where, and I found another one where I, I'm suddenly snapped out of reality. Found a good one. I found an, another where I'm suddenly snapped out of reality by Anthony Kiedis telling me that he's going to decorate my face. Like he sees in you, Bastards of you know, Light. Sounds like I'll, a Dillinger escape plan. I'll, song. You, you listen, pay listen, attention listen. a lot. To it, to like him talking about faces, I'm realizing. I'll decorate your face. He fucking sings about faces a lot. I'll decorate your face. <laughs> it's time to get it on. How does that crimson taste? Like, what am I supposed to be, take away from that? Is that so? You you have this obvious sexual euphemism, right? I'll decorate your face. Okay, ha ha. Very cheap. Very very schoolboy. It's time to get it on. Cool. How is the crimson taste? Are you is coming he, blood? Is he coming blood? Uh, yeah. What right. am I supposed to take away from that? It's a callback to blood sugar sex magic. Standing in my heart on bleeding. Okay, so I get, okay, I'm looking at the whole song. Of now. course I, it I think is. I get it. I think I get it. It's a song about a fist fight, right? Like it's a song about being in a fight. And, and okay. I bet it is. So that's what it is. It's a song about fisting. Yeah. I mean, meet me at the old meat market. When it's said and done, can I please make you come? Like- <laughs> Is this masturbation, sex, fighting? I don't know, but this is you the know, thing. Like, wait, I have an idea. Maybe, maybe this is like a, a Fight Club like commentary about the intrinsic relationship between in human nature between violence and sex. I, I think that's what Kiedis is going for. You know, now that you've explained it to Chuck me, he's a big Chuck Palahniuk fan. Yeah, my, it's my, it's a really clever reference. It goes over the heads of a lot of idiots. My life is a rope swing, always heading back to from where I came. <laughs> That's a real lyric on this album. See, the rope I, swing is representative of the push and pull of the moon. You see, it's like everyone. the rotation of the moon is emblematic of cycles of grief and violence. <laughs> It's my, a very intelligent. My like, name is I love you. I'll, I'll get this like, wait, hold on. I got my notes mixed up. Um, this is for tools lateralis. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I can't stand this microwaved Freddie Mercury looking man. It, it's like if you pulled something out of like a brown paper sack labeled rock star, uh, you'd get something that kind of looks like Anthony Kiedis, I'd bet. Well, I don't know what I expect. We, we didn't even talk about the lead single for this. Black oh yeah, Summer. Black Summer. I feel like we should at least acknowledge that as kind of the song that they put out. Before um, we say anything about it, I'm just going to go ahead and say that this is the best song on the album. It's my favorite song. Favorite song is actually Aquatic Mouth Dance, funnily enough, because I think that has some of the most interesting musical textures. There's a great little like saxophone part on that song and it's kind of a little bit it's no it's not it's much better than kenny g uh and there's a lot actually going on there that i enjoy sonically so shout out to that i don't have more to say beyond that but we do need to talk about black summer because it is the lead single tax fraud (laughs) it is the lead single and um oh i remember actually when this came out uh one of us sent it to our group chat and we were all just like I guess kind of listening to this together in a staggered way of like, oh my gosh, this is what it is. Wow, it's bullshit. We were making so much fun of the way he sings on this when he's like, chain is on the dark side of the moon. (laughs) That still makes me laugh every time I think about it. (laughs) I don't have anything funny to say. It's just waiting on another black summer to end. I, I love how this is like the most generic like paint by numbers rock single ever released. It's like you gotta have an acoustic part, a slow part, a slow chorus, a faster verse, big chorus, big verse, big chorus. It's like 
it's so paint by numbers it's so bland i think i want to kind of tidy this up by reading a, a quote from flea talking about this song and about the stage of the band's career which i think will um tell you what i think all you need to know about how this band operate in the philosophy of the red hot chili peppers which i'm sure to some people is beautiful i mean even divorced from the music to me there's a beauty here but I'm just going to read this and you can all take away from it whatever you want. So textually, you just said to some people that are fucking idiots, lowly subhumans. <laughs> Jesus Christ. As we embark into this new era of the band, we're just so grateful for the opportunity to be playing with John for Shanty again. For all of us, it's just beautiful. We're able to connect in a very profound way. And I think that all four of us share an appreciation for that connection in a way that we might never have been able to share before. Sometimes you have to go through time to really appreciate things. The power of humility and the power of having faith, the power of equality in one another, the power of trusting and letting go and letting the cosmic light flow through is very powerful indeed. This band is really excited about stuff. The recording of the music, the composing of the music, the talking to one another in the context of making new music is something that's very sacred to us and very private, and we don't share it with anybody. We just get by ourselves in a room and we connect with one another. Yay. When we finally get to the point where <laughs> we all agree that it's done and we put it out, it's no longer ours. The song Black Summer no longer belongs to us. It belongs to you. I hope that it does good things for you. I hope that it serves you well. I hope that it brings about good things in your life. Favorite tracks and ratings for Unlimited Love by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, my least favorite track is probably a Chinese Satellite. And um, I think I'd give the album a, a solid... Uh, Solid 3.5. Oh, I'm, I'm out of my word. <laughs> All right. So my uh, drinker. <sighs> my my three favorite songs on here are gonna be uh none of them. Woo! My my least favorite song is gonna be all of them. I, I've been thinking about what to rate this, and I've, I, I'm thinking it's going to be somewhere above a 13, but like below an 18. <laughs> oh. How lo How come? How come we don't have the allegations yet? Where are the allegations? Come forward. We know you're out there. Cancel this man. I don't know why I'm being so <laughs> aggressive to the people that Anthony Kiedis has likely abused. <laughs> Come forward. Please, we need you. <laughs> it is simple. We kill Anthony Kiedis. We need this band to be... We need... Oh, God. Please, please, please. Um, <laughs> In a way, I knew your bandmates better than you ever did. <laughs> Um, all right. John Frusciante has definitely like done some fucking awful shit. Like he's done some fucking horror. No, but like, I don't want to get dark here and I'm not even going to say what I'm thinking, but like just the vibe to me is like someday we're going to find out that he did some like really awful, like horrific shit. <laughs> I genuinely believe this. And and I, I just I want to put my stake in the ground and say that that's going to happen. I believe it. And I'm it not, not I, I hope it doesn't forever. because I hope that he hasn't done these things. But I believe deep down that like some awful like Dr. Sleep-esque shit is, has, has happened. And I don't even know what that means. Do, do you mean that he like bisects Jacob Tremblay? 
I believe he's done something that's even worse than that. I, I fuck, I need it. Me turns children into mist and eats. <laughs> Could would you like? Would you care to give your favorite tracks? I need ratings? August. I need you to give me a number out of ten. A, a number out of ten. Yeah, seven. That's not a real number in this context. What? What? No, I mean, I, I mean, I need you to rate the album out of ten. Oh, okay. Because you said you, you made a fucking pedo joke, and it was very funny, but you still didn't give me a number. <laughs> okay, uh, I I see this what you're saying. Segment. Let's statutory no, rape out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll give it a three. Same thing I gave Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Anthony Kiedis, the white R. Kelly. Um, Morgan has, what's Morgan said? I'll read his notes. Barely a record. It exists. It sounds like a record made to be an excuse to tour, and even then they should have tried harder. Why is this an hour and 13 minutes? Like 45 minutes at maximum, guys. We cast return record for Fashanti. Depressing. Yeah. Four yeah. Out of, four out of 10. Um, my favorite tracks. I just want you to fart really loudly into the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> I had one. And I've, been, I've been doing some really bad ones this week, too. It's a shame I don't have one. Um <laughs> Um, I don't know. My f- favorite tracks of Aquatic Love Paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> Aquatic Blowjob. Cool. Aqu- <laughs> Aquatic Napalm Death. Um, <laughs> I don't remember what it's called, man. Something. Least favorite track. Um, coming on her titties. <laughs> <laughs> Um, pissing on her stepdaughter. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, four out of ten. Uh, this album gets a, an average rating of three point six. Which of the um, books? Which yeah, it's certainly a. Yeah. I mean, the Michael. We gave the Mal- spoiler alert for Tuesday, but we gave the Michael Bolton album a higher rating than this. So that tells you all you need to know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a genuinely a, a, better record. It's a three point six for the Red Hot Chili Peppers Unlimited Spunk. Let me know mm. in the comments <laughs> below if you're listening on YouTube what you think of any of the albums that we've discussed today. If you're on a podcast streaming platform, head on over to YouTube by clicking the link in the description and leave us an idea what you think. Uh, we appreciate your support as well. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a like or a five-star rate and review. Really helps us out. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already. We put out three videos a week and we review new records, old records, and all things in between. Uh, usually better stuff than this, but we have a let's have some have some fun with it. Uh, and and um yeah, if you really want to support the channel, you can hit the join button. And for just one buck a month, you can support us, help us to be able to keep doing what we do. And you get your name featured at the beginning of every single video on this channel. You get priority comment response. And if you want to recommend us some music to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Yeah, that's really all I have. I hope this has been enjoyable for you. I just want my phone call. <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna go in and, and put a shotgun in my mouth. <laughs> Why don't you take us out? All right, as always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Frank's Red Hoss, Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. <laughs> <laughs>